Praise the Lord. All right, so as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the joy of being at the table of the Lord to dine with him. Thank you for the revelation of your word and the mysteries of the gospel. And thank you for your spirit that comes to teach us and instruct us tonight. We pray, Lord, you reveal the depths of heaven unto us in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that you bless us as we study the word together. You solve the problems of every life in Jesus' name. Keep us awake. Give us understanding. Enlighten us in your word. Apply the word to every life in Jesus' name. And through the study, make us victorious in our Christian lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thank you very much. We're coming to John chapter 16. And tonight we're studying from chapter 16, verses 1 to 11. John chapter 16, verses 1 through to 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh. That whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. These things will they do unto you, because they know not, they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. And now, but now, I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, so was filled your heart. Nevertheless, it is expedient, it is, uh, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I want you to look at verses 5 and 6 again. As we think about those verses we have read, it says, but now, I go my way to him that sent me. He was going back to heaven. He came from heaven. He was going back to the Father. He came from the Father. And now he says, I've done what he has told me to do on earth. I'm about to finish my ministry, my calling, and the purpose of why I came. I'm about to finish that on the cross of Calvary. And he says, I said, I'm going away, and none of you has kept me with a grace thou. But because I have said these things unto you, because I told you I'm leaving, I'm going up, I'm going to the Father, I'm going to heaven. Because I tell you this truth, and this revelation sorrow has filled your heart. Tonight we are actually looking at the ministry of the abiding comforter. Because Jesus Christ told his disciples, he said, yes, I said I'm going. But if I go, I will send the Spirit unto you. That is the Comforter. And it is expedient for you that I send him unto you. If I go not away, he will not come unto you. But when I go, 
And then I get to the Father. I will plead with the Father, pray to the Father, talk to the Father, and the Father will send him unto you. And so we're talking about the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth. And it says, it will abide with you forever. But the point is, they were sorrowful. Because the presence of Jesus had meant so much to these disciples. He had called them to repentance and he had responded. Not only that, he had saved them and their lives were transformed. Not only that, he was instructing them and they were learning the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They had never heard anything like this before. Such a master, such a teacher, such an instructor teaching them. They had never seen the miracles they saw before. And they had never read about anything similar to that. And now he said, the great miracle worker said, I'm going. And the master said, I'm going. The teacher, the instructor, he said, I am going. He had chosen them to be friends. And they had experienced the reality of God being their father. He always taught them, he said, when you talk to God, say, a father which art in heaven. And when you are praying, you are praying so that your father in heaven will give good things unto you. He even told them, uh, if those fathers in the world are able to give good things to his children, to their children, how much more your father, which is in heaven, will give you wonderful things and great things and even give you the Holy Ghost. They were authorized and they were empowered to do the same works that Christ had done. And even though the world had hated them, they didn't feel the pain of that hatred. Why? Because the protective presence of Christ was with them. And now, with all he made for them, and all he made to them, with all he did for them, he said he was going away. Now that he said he was going away and leaving them behind, there was something they were thinking about. What will happen to us? When dangers come, what happens? When difficulties arrive, what happens? And when persecution increases, what happens unto us? And that's the reason why their hearts were filled with sorrow. And let's see what he had done for them that they were thinking about. And they were thinking what will be the replacement? Who will be the replacement of what Christ had done? We're looking at Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, and he goes up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. That's it. He called them. He called them to repentance. He called them to salvation. He called them to service, and they came unto him. Look at their calling, chapter 2 of Mark, and I'm reading from verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus had it, he said unto them, They that behold, they that are whole, have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He called them to repentance and they responded. And they left all their sins behind. They left all their evils behind. And they left all the darkness behind. And they came to Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, and they were saved. Look at Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, you see the calling he gave. And you see the effect of that calling upon these disciples, what he did for them and what he did in them in transforming their lives. We're looking at Luke chapter 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. All these disciples were lost, lost in sin. Lost in darkness, lost in society, and lost in the world before Christ came. And before Christ called them, and he called them out of their lost situation, lost their status, and he, they came into the kingdom. And now they could say they were learning from the Lord. What were they learning? They were learning the mysteries of the kingdom. That's why when he said he was going away, they were thinking, who will teach us the mysteries of the kingdom? who will lead us into the height, into the depth, into the length and the breadth of the knowledge that comes from heaven. Who is like this Christ? Who is like this Savior? Who is like this Redeemer? Who is like this miracle worker? Now is going 
What are we going to do when we are left behind? That's why they were sad. He told them in chapter 13. In chapter 13 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew 13 verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you. This was disciples to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. You see that? Things they had never known beyond the surface, deep things of God, the mysteries of the kingdom. He was teaching them and they were learning. And then he tells them in verse, in verse 12, For whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more. He shall have more in abundance. How are we going to have the more if you go away? How are we going to have the depth and the great things or teaching if you go away? It says, but whosoever has not from him shall be taken even that he hath. And these uh, people, not only that they repented, not only that they were saved, they had eternal life, eternal life. And this was the only source. Religion had not given them eternal life before Christ came. And all their worship had not given them eternal life before Christ came. Now Christ came. And he came into their lives. And he blessed them. And he turned them around. And he transformed their lives. And they had eternal life. They knew they were chosen. They felt it in their heart. They knew it in their heart. These were the mighty power of God that turned their lives around. And the sorrowful heart now is because of he was going away. If you were, if you were in their condition, what would you think? That this Christ is going away? You will be uncertain about the future. You will not know what was going to happen. That's why he said, now I've told you that I'm going away and you are sorrowful. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 67. John chapter 6, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. We've got eternal life. We've got everlasting life. We've got the very life of God in us. And you gave that to us. To whom shall we go? And to know and to hear that this one who had saved them, who had chosen them, who had brought them into the kingdom, who had revealed the mysteries of the kingdom to them, that was going away, they never felt any pain like that before. The pain of an absent Christ. That Christ was going to be absent from them. They couldn't stand that. That's why it says... They were sorrowful in their hearts. In John chapter 15, verse 15. John chapter 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, but for the servant knoweth not what his master doeth, what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. They were having secrets from heaven every day. Things that the priest never had, and things that the uh, people in the old covenant never had, and things that the high priest, even in the nation at that time, did not have. Look at this in verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever... Think about such a promise like this that was given to them that whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, he will give it to you. Somebody said there, amen. amen. And then uh, they had experienced some hatred. But you know, they didn't feel the hatred. Pharisees hated them. They didn't care. Sadducees hated them. They didn't care. The world hated them. They didn't care. You know why? Because the protective uh, power and the protection of Christ was around them. Christ was there. What could they care about the hatred of the world? Look at verse 18 there. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. They knew something. 
What did he know? Chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. Chapter 17, verse 14. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. They had the mark of heaven upon them. They had the image, the superscription of heaven upon them. They had the favor of heaven upon them. And even though the world hated them, the hatred of the world was nothing to them because, because Christ was with them. And Christ said, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Look at verse, look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. While he was with them, he was the one praying for them. Anything they needed, once they looked at Jesus, uh, just a single sentence, he provided that for them. Now he was saying, Father, I'm praying to you, you keep them away from the evil. After he has gone, they were now thinking, you know, what will happen? When we get into danger, when we are on the stormy sea, who prays for us, who handles all these problems for us. Look at verse 16. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We're coming to chapter 9 of Luke. Not only that, he gave them power, he gave them authority. And who could give them that? How could they have that? And now that he announced to them, now that he proclaimed to them, I am going away. They already began to look at their weakness after he was gone. They looked at their predicament after he was gone. And they looked at their perplexity after he was gone. And they were saying, who will substitute? Who will be the replacement of Christ in their lives? That's why they were sad. If you were and you didn't know what was in the future, you might be having the same perspiration and the same pain in your heart. Look at chapter 9 of Luke. In Luke chapter 9, it says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. He told them that I'm giving you power, giving you authority over all devils and over and to cure diseases look at the next chapter there in the next chapter we're looking at chapter 10 and verse 19 chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 19 it says behold i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over tell me all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you he was a friend, he was the captain, he was the master, he was the lord, he was the director, he was the forerunner, he was everything to them. But now he said, I'm going away, I'm going away. And when he said, I'm going away, their minds began to think about all the things of the past, what he had meant to them, what he had done for them, what he had provided for them, and the privileges he had given them. He had even given them information. There's no way they could have known that information without his telling them look at verse 20 in verse 20 notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven who could have told them that who could have given them the information who could have gone to the register of heaven and then come back and tell them your names are written in the book of life in heaven that's the reason they were sad now because Christ was going away. Come back to John. You understand John now? As we read chapter 16 and we're reading from verses 5 and 6. John chapter 16 verses 5 and 6. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. As we look at all the 11 verses that we are studying today, and the, the message is, as I've told you before, the ministry of the abiding comforter. The ministry of the abiding comforter. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the disciples' misunderstanding of an absent Christ. Christ was going to be absent. 
Christ was going away from them. And they misunderstood all that. And they were thinking they, it would be a disadvantage for them. And that's the reason why they were sorrowful. The disciples' misunderstanding of an absent Christ. Point number two. The distinguished manifestation in his advantageous coming. The comforter was coming. The spirit of truth was coming. And the spirit of power was coming. The dynamite of heaven was coming. He was the comforter, the paraclete, the one that will stay by their side and help them along. And because of his advantageous coming, there will be distinguished manifestations. The distinguished manifestation in his advantageous coming. Point number three, the dynamic ministry of the abiding comforter. The abiding comforter, he comes to them now. That's the comforter, that's the Holy Ghost. And if they're going to be immersed in the Holy Ghost. They're going to be saturated with the Holy Ghost. They're going to be endued, overwhelmed, and beloved by the Holy Ghost. They're going to be totally surrounded and controlled and filled with the Holy Ghost. And was going to abide with them. Not a year, not three years, not five years, not ten years. It was going to abide with them for forever and was going to carry on a dynamic ministry heavenly ministry through them the dynamic ministry of the abiding comforter but we're going to start from number one tell me your number one over there the disciples misunderstanding of an absent christ we're looking at uh, chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 1 Chapter 16, reading from verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. I'm telling you all this so that when it happens, you'll not be offended. You'll not say, eh, what came on us and what decision did we make? How do we follow this Christ? And now there's disappointment. What are we going to do? He was telling them ahead of time. Warning them ahead of time. Revealing to them ahead of time. So that when these things happen, they will not be disappointed. They will not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. They couldn't do that all this time because you are totally associated with me. You are totally attached unto me. But now I'm going. And when I'm gone, and you go to the synagogues, and you say what I'm telling you to say, you preach what I'm instructing you to preach, they're going to turn you, cast you out of their synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that you so ever kill it you will think he doeth God's service. The Lord Jesus was telling them, the people are so twisted in their mind, and they're so erroneous in their way of thinking, and they would have this wrong idea, they would leave their real ministry, the ministry of helping the people of Israel, they leave their real ministry, the ministry of directing them to God and leading them to God, they leave their real ministry of making atonement the way they need the old covenant for the sins of the people, they would leave the ministry of reconciling the people unto God, they'll think that the real ministry and service now is to persecute the disciples, to destroy the disciples, to kill the disciples, and they will think they were doing service unto God. The Lord Jesus was telling them ahead of time that when these people do these things, they will think they were doing right, and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. They'll be religious, but they won't have any reconciliation with God. They won't have any righteousness from God. They won't have any relationship with God. And it says in verse 4, But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. Whatever happens, all these Bible studies we are going through, when those things happen, we will remember. I will remember. Uh, you know, it's a pity if uh, somebody is a teacher of the word of God and everything he has taught that, you know, persecution will come, difficulties will come, slander will come, they'll get you out of their denominations, out of their synagogues. And then when those things happen, then the teacher himself cannot remember. That will be a pity. It will be a pity if the minister, if a member of the church, if a worker in the church, after hearing all these things, after knowing all these things, persecution will come, misunderstanding 
understanding will come and oppression will come these disciples will be persecuted he had told them before he was just repeating it for them we're looking at matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 and we're reading from verse 10 matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 10 persecution in the absence of christ after christ was gone in matthew chapter 24 verse 10 there and then shall many be offended you not be so sorrowful you go away from the lord in jesus name give me a good good amen, amen. and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise shall rise and shall deceive many but and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end who is that he that shall endure unto the end i said who is that you are there you'll endure in jesus name but he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come it said the persecution will come it tells us in luke chapter 6 luke chapter 6 we're reading from verse 22 luke chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 22 blessed are ye when men shall hate you and, and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast you out and cast cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake because you believe in jesus the son of man to be your savior to be your redeemer because you believe that jesus christ is the only savior and religion cannot save morality cannot save all those are good intentions to the world cannot save i give money to this i give money to that project of the world all those things cannot save jesus is the savior is the lamp of god that takes the sin of the world away and as you put your faith in him you put your trust and confidence in him and you're not trusting your own works you're not trusting your own religion you're not trusting you know, all the efforts of man you say jesus is my savior it's it says because of that they'll hate you the people of the world it says they'll separate you from their company they'll say you are not a member of their family anymore they'll throw your name out they, they say you don't have any part of them the lord said in verse 23 don't cry what did he say in verse 23 don't be sorrowful what did he say in verse 23 and don't hang your head in shame and say, oh me, look at what has happened to me. What did he say in verse 23? Yeah. Rejoice. And you know, many people, they don't remember that. When there's persecution, when there's slander, when there's lie against your life, and when they, they throw your name out, when they say you don't have any mouth to talk, you've gone to join, born again, born again people, shut up. You're not part of this society anymore. Then they are sorrowful. Then they feel lonely. I pray you'll not feel lonely at such a time. That's the time to remember that Jesus Christ said, when people oppose you, when people persecute you, when people slander you, and when people reject you, you don't have a feeling of depression. Rejoice ye in that day and live for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Look at verse 26. But tell me verse 26 it tell me out aloud say it very well read everything there and you see that there are people that are looking for the world to love them the world to vote for them and the world to appreciate them and you know what they do they try to talk what the world wants to hear and they try to join the societies the world 
elevate and they try to look like the world and dress like the world and they try to join this society that society and they try to be in the good books of the people of the world and they, try, they have one leg in the church and one leg in the world they have one part of their heart in the church and one part of their heart in the world and they, because they want business and because they want this and because they want that and they want uh, people to recommend them in the world and Jesus said if you're running away from the reality of Christianity you're running away from the reality of serving the Lord and you're running away from the reality of standing standing for the right and standing for righteousness you're running away from the hatred of the people you're running away from taking an uncompromising stand so that the salvation you profess and the salvation you say you possess that salvation everybody can see if they want to persecute you let them go ahead let them know that this is the real child of God this is a real follower of Jesus Christ and they persecute you but no 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 there are some people that are dodging all that and they try to be like the world six days of the week a uh, Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday they're like the world only one Sunday in fact it's not the whole Sunday in the morning they come to church and they act like angel praise the Lord hallelujah they remove all the other things of the world and they dress like an angel and they come and see people say brother welcome sister welcome don't call them brother because when they go out they're totally different I'm not talking about you I'm talking about some other people you are not like that I am not like that look at verse 26 warn to you when all men shall speak well of you if that's your goal if that's your mission if that's your aspiration if that's your ambition you want the world to love you you want your families in the world that do not know christ you want them to speak well of you want you when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers to the to the false prophets the second thing we're seeing john come back to john john chapter 16 and i'm reading now verses 3 and 4 their perception of the animosity their perception of the animosity we're looking at chapter 16 verse 3 and in this place it says and these six will they do unto you because they have not known the father nor me but these six have I told you uh, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things uh, I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. Now the Lord Jesus wanted them to understand what wanted them to perceive the animosity of the world. Come back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 8, if, ye were, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. It's saying that if the world hates you, if the world opposes you, if the world does anything that is contrary to peace and contrary to your joy and contrary to your expectation, you understand, they did that to me. And because I am Christ and you are Christians, Christians, Christ, Christ, Christians, you are associated with me. You are connected with me. And you have my character. You reflect my life. You reflect my light. That's why they will do that to you. They did that to me, and they will do it to you. Look at verse 19. If you were the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world. Thank God I'm not of the world. Say it well. Say that your heart will understand. Say it with conviction. You must remember that in the office you are not of the world. Whatever they are doing, they are cheating, they are signing, whatever, and they are trying to steal money from the office. You remember, I am not of the world. You remember, whenever they are doing something you know, that is not of God, and the family says, come and join, come and contribute your quota, come and contribute your part. They are worshipping idol. They want you to be part of them. They say, this is family idol, and they say, this is family religion. They say, this is family decision. I am not of the world. You will not join them in Jesus' name. It may be in your school, it may be in your college, it may be in your community. They're doing something that only the people of the world can plan, only the people of the world can do. Thank God you are not of the world. 
Can you say that again? I'm not of the world. It says, if he were of the world, the world would love his own. But because he are not of the world, but I have chosen you. I have chosen you. Out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. Verse 20, remember, the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sin, they will, they will keep yours also also verse 21 but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because because they know not him that sent me i pray that when that time comes you'll rejoice even in the persecution in jesus name uh, let me show you something look at this in acts chapter 13 acts chapter 13 we're reading from verse 15 Acts chapter 13, verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Expelled them out of their coast. Only because they represented Christ, they expelled them. Because they preached Christ, they expelled them. Because they stood for Christ, they expelled them. Because they were shining for the light of the gospel of Christ. That's why they expelled them. And in, in verse 52, and the disciples were filled with, tell me. Are you sorrowful? What a pity. I belong to deeper life. Was it like that? If it were not for deeper life now, if it were not for taking my stand, if it were not for, you know, they, they told us to stand, and I tried to stand, and I've not even stood a hundred percent. I just tried a little, but look at what they're doing to me. Did they do that? No. When they rejected them, when they expelled them, when they persecuted them, they rejoiced. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said it will happen and it is happening and so we rejoice because it's a mark. We belong to the Lord. When your own time comes and they persecute you and they lie against you, you will not cry. You will not be sobbing. You will not be regretting. You'll not be reconsidering, will I go on, will I not go on? Will I still stand, will I not stand? As for me, I will stand. I said, I will stand. The time of persecution is not the time to collapse. The time of persecution is not the time to compromise. The time of persecution is not the time to cry. The time of persecution is to remember this is the mark, I belong to Christ. And this is the evidence, I belong to Christ. And it says, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Give me a good amen. amen. Come to John. We're looking at John now. Uh, we're coming to uh, the, the, the third uh, part here. The pain of his admonition. The pain of his admonition. He had admonished them. I'm going away. He had announced to them, I'm going away. He had told them, you will not see me for some time, but I'm going away for your, for your good, for your expediency, because I'm going to send the comforter unto you. Look at chapter 16 of John, verse 6, verse 6. But because I said on these things unto thee, sorrow has filled that your heart. Because I said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Look up here for a moment. Let's think about this now. Jesus Christ told them, what did he tell them? I'm going to the Father. And it was sorrowful. What do you think of that? Jesus said, I'm going to heaven. They were sorrowful. What do you think of that? Jesus said, I left my glory. But now I'm going back, I'm picking up that glory again. I'm going to be glorified with the Father. And I'm going to be the Lord and the Master of the angels as I go back. You think about that? And they were sorrowful. Why were they sorrowful? Number one, they were selfish in their consideration. Selfish in their consideration. They were thinking about themselves. What are we going to have? What are we going to enjoy? What's going to happen to us? He is going, that's better for him. He's going to heaven, that's better for him. 
is going to be with the father. That's better for him. They didn't think about that. They were selfish in their consideration. Number two, they were superficial in their love superficial in their love. It was going to the better place. It was going to a higher place. It was going to the better country. It was going to the heavenly habitation. And they were sorrowful because they were superficial in their love. I love you. I love you. Stay with me. I love you. Stay suffering here. I love you. Don't go away. I love you. Don't go to a better place. They were superficial in their love. Number three, they were shallow in their understanding. Shallow in their understanding. They didn't think about Calvary. They didn't think about the death of Christ bringing salvation to multitudes, not only in Israel, but all over the world, all over many generations. They didn't understand all that Christ was going to do at Calvary when he said I was going away. Number four, they were satisfied without Calvary, without Pentecost. If Jesus Christ had not gone away, the way he said was going away, I'm going to heaven, brother, go through the cross. I'm going to the better country, but I'm going going through Calvary. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost unto you. They were, Calvary had not happened. They were satisfied. Stay with us. Don't go to Calvary. Calvary has not happened. The salvation of the whole of humanity had not been provided for. And yet they said, stay with us. And they were sorrowful. Pentecost had not come. That Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost endowment, Holy Ghost baptism had not come. And yet they were satisfied without Pentecost. Number five, they were short-sighted concerning his eternal purpose. Short-sighted. He didn't just come for Peter. He came for the whole world. Behold the lamp of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And it is that that's what Jesus came to do. He doesn't want to just be limited to Peter going in and coming out, getting into the boat and uh, stopping the storm, throw your net there and catch fish. That's, that's not the ultimate in the ministry of Jesus. He, he was to have that fulfillment of the eternal purpose and they were short-sighted concerning that eternal purpose. Number six, they were scared of persecution. Actually, they were scared. If Christ goes away and is no more with us, what's going to happen? They were not considering Christ. They were not considering heaven. They were not considering eternity. They were scared of persecution without the physical presence of Christ. Number seven, they were secured in their limitation. Secured in their limitation. You know what? He had told them, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. What are those converts? The day of Pentecost that will bring 3,000 into the kingdom had not happened. They didn't understand that Jesus Christ was going away for their benefit. They were secured in their limitation. If the Lord had yielded to their selfish pressure. I want you to think about, about this now. If Jesus had said, all right, stay with us here. Okay, I stay. Let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. Okay, go ahead and build, and we're going to stay here. If Jesus are here to that, if Jesus has yielded to what Peter said, not so, Lord. This will never happen to you. You will never die. You will never go to the cross. If you had yielded, and when they said, where are you going now? Where goest thou? Whither goest thou? Whither goest thou? And then there were tears on their faces. Where are you going? Where are you going? If Jesus had yielded to their pressure, you know what would have happened? There would have been no gracious Calvary. Grace coming from Calvary. To the, to the sinners all over the world, reaching out. Look at that man on the cross. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That will not have happened. There'll be no grace coming from Calvary. There would have been no great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because, you know, they were limited to Israel. Only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel when Christ was with them. It was Calvary. It was Pentecost that brought the fulfillment of the grace great commission to go into all the world if Jesus Christ had yielded to their pressure their selfish pressure and their self-centered pressure there would have been no gracious Calvary there would have been no great commission there would have been no global 
Gentile conversions. Global Gentile conversions. All over the world, Gentiles getting converted. Globally, Gentiles getting converted is because he did not yield to their pressure. Number four, there would have been no greater, better covenant because it was at Calvary that she finalized that covenant, the great covenant, the greater covenant, the better covenant. Why it not the fact that he dismissed and discounted and disregarded all the pressure we were putting. Where are you going? Why are you going? Are you going to leave us like this? If you go, what's going to become of us? If he had yielded to their pressure, there will be no greater, better uh, covenant. Number five, there will be no guiding, abiding comforter. The comforter would not have come because while he was here, the comforter would not come. It required that he will go away and then the comforter will come. Number six, there will be no gospel comfort confirmation gospel confirmation they went about everywhere and the spirit of god confirmed the word was signs following all that would not happen if he had stayed with them number seven there'll be no glorious consummation glorious consummation coronation that eventually he asked the crown eventually all the angels of heaven the living creatures in heaven and all the men of heaven redeemed men in heaven they worship him saying glory glory to the lamb you know why because he fulfilled and finished what the father had sent him to do if he had yielded to their pressure all those things will not have happened think about this now the same thing happens in our local churches and you know when deeper life started we're all here in lagos just one branch in lagos over there maybe you know the story and then we began to see some people that were you know very essential very important in our ministry then at that time over here we said you go there and then if they didn't go think about that and then we said you go there and they were bible study leaders uh, you know in Ajegunle, in morocco in this place and that place and we took them away from there you go here you go here you go there it is that sending them for that brought the gospel to every place and the grace of god flowed from this center here and went everywhere if the members at that time in that local church morocco in the local church here yeah, but in the local church uh, there you know or wherever if they were sorrowful and said why are they taking them away why is this going to happen the gospel will not spread and it is not love it's selfishness it is not love it is misunderstanding of the purpose of god and of the goodness of god to make the gospel reach out to other places that's why jesus said why are you sorrowful I'm going away and it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. I pray we'll grow up in our understanding. I said we'll grow up in our understanding. We'll not be like, you know, the crying Peter, the crying Philip, and the crying Andrew, and the crying John, and the crying James. Don't go, don't go. Thank God he went to Calvary. Thank God he went to sacrifice for us. Thank God now we have salvation because he will not yield to their pressure. When the time comes in your own district and when the time comes in your own environment and some people are putting pressure, putting pressure, don't go, don't go, we're going. We're going to preach the gospel. And we're going to touch everywhere with the gospel in Jesus' name. Give me a good day, amen. Okay, I'm going to ask you a difficult question. The Lord might say that your group pastor is taking to go here and go and pray the gospel outside our little local uh, Lagos church here. If it happens, we'll say praise the Lord. Aha, uh -huh, that's you now. I said if it is happens, what do you say? Praise. praise the Lord. It will happen in Jesus' name. And you, a good pastor, you know, you are so attached to the local church and you're sitting down there and I'm looking at you from the color of your face and from the look of your face. I'm thinking if I come to approach you, you might, you know, almost be like a crying Peter. And that's why I'm not talking to you. And if you know that I would have spoken to you, you were looking at my move and all that. Then I came and then I drew back. Come yourself, come and say I'm ready. And say, I'm ready. Somebody there, you are ready. Yeah. I said, somebody there is ready. Yeah. 
There's one on the platform with me here. We are ready. God bless every one of you. I want a good, good amen there. Now, we're coming to point number two, the distinguished manifestation in his advantageous coming. The distinguished manifestation in his advantageous coming. Look at, look at this. We're looking at John chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 7. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Nevertheless, whatever your sorrow, I tell you the truth. Nevertheless, whatever your wrong is thinking, I tell you the truth. Nevertheless, whatever you say going on in your mind, in your heart, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. What, whatever little knowledge you have, selfishness you have, and whatever misunderstanding of my announcement you have, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Amen. Amen. Uh, look at this. Look at this. Expedient that I go away. Expedient that I go away. We're looking at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 50. John chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 50. In verse 50 here is what it says. It says, Now consider that it is expedient for us. Here was Caiaphas talking. Here was the high priest talking. I wonder Peter did not understand this. I wonder James and John did not understand this. I wonder even the disciples of Jesus did not understand this. I wonder the people that were close to the heart of Christ, they were close to the mind of Christ, they were close to the revelation of the Lord himself. I wonder they didn't understand. And yet Caiaphas understood. He says, no, consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Look at what the, what the high priest said. He said, this good, this experience, that one man will die for the nation. Look at verse 51. And they speak he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. You see that? Expedient that he died for the nation. Expedient that he sacrificed for the nation. Verse 52. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that was scattered abroad. The going of Christ was expedient. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14 of John and verse 28. John chapter 14, verse 28. It says, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me in reality, if you love me, my purpose, if you love me, the fulfillment of my calling, if you love me, ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father for the Father, my Father, is greater than I. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 2 of Acts. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. We're reading from verse 33. Expedient that he went away. Expedient that he went to the Father. We're looking at uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 33. It says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which he now see and hear. That's what he said. It's better. It's more profitable. It's expedient that I go away. Because if I go not away, the comforter, the power, the dynamite, dynamis will not come unto you. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's expedient. That's better. That's more profitable. That is going to heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. Come back to John chapter 16. 
We're reading from verse 7, John chapter 16, reading from verse 7. It tells us in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. That's what we have looked at. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. If I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. It's the going away of Christ that brings the comforter. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14 verse 16. John chapter 14 verse 16. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That's another of the same kind. All that have been to you, he will be to you. All that have been for you, he'll do for you. And even much more, he will abide with you. He says, I will pray the Father. I will tell the Father. I will ask the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. Capital C there. Another comforter is coming from heaven. It's the third personality of the Holy Ghost. And he says, and that he may abide with you. For how long? And then he says in verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but she know him, for he dwelleth with you, and what will happen? It shall be in you. And then he tells us in verse 20, hey, look at verse 18 there, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come unto you. When the comforter comes, you will not be comfortless. Amen. Verse 26, in verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the, Father will, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. I'll be your teacher. I'll be your instructor. The Holy Ghost is coming. And when that Holy Ghost comes, he will teach you how many things? All things. And bring how many things? All things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And that's the importance, that's the expediency of the coming of the Holy Ghost. We're looking at chapter 15, verse 26. Chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall be a witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Luke chapter 24, the coming of the Holy Ghost, the advantage of that coming, the profit in that coming, the expediency in that coming of the comforter, the Holy Ghost. We're looking in at chapter 24 of Luke. Luke chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 49. It says in verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. It will happen. Amen. And look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. It says, If I go, I will send him the comforter unto you. The comforter eventually come. He came and it will come to you in Jesus name. Amen. Chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Verse 31. Then at the church's rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Multiplication will come. Yeah. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 31. In verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were, how many of them? All filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. That's the expediency. That's the advantage of the coming of the comforter. Look at verse 33. And with great power. What kind of power? And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Chapter 8 of Acts. Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Because the Holy Ghost had come. 
And when the Holy Ghost comes upon your life and refreshes you, energizes you, saturates you, overwhelms you, and close you, what will you do? You'll go everywhere preaching the word. I said, you'll go everywhere preaching the word. Yeah. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord give heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with pulses, and that were lame were healed. Verse 8, everybody want to three go. That's the advantage of the coming of the comforter. That's the, that's the experience of the coming of the comforter. And there was great joy in that city. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. When the Holy Ghost comes, because Christ has gone, because Christ had done his work at Calvary, because Christ rose again, because Christ has ascended to the Father, and because he has spoken to the Father, pleaded with the Father, prayed to the Father, and sought from the Father, the Father has sent the Holy Ghost now, and now diverse kinds of gifts of the Holy Ghost because of the coming of the Holy Ghost. Now, as the Holy Ghost comes, we're coming back to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, when he comes, look at what he does. Now, number, point number three, the dynamic ministry of the abiding comforter. The dynamic ministry of the abiding comforter. It tells us from verse 8, and when he is come, referring to the Holy Ghost, and when he is come, referring to the comforter, and when he is come, referring to the paraclete, the, the helper, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Number one, of sin because they believe not on me. Number two, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Number three, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged already. It says when the Holy Ghost comes, when the Comforter comes, when that spirit of truth comes, when the spirit that comes to testify of Jesus Christ and he energizes us to preach and to witness and to win souls, when he comes, he will do three things. Number Number one, reprove the world of sin. Reprove the world of sin. Number two, recall us to righteousness. It will recall us to righteousness. Number three, remind us of the judgment to come. Remind us of the judgment to come. Number one, he'll reprove the world of sin. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same, that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were preached in their heart. They were reproved of their sin. They were reproved of their wickedness. They were reproved of their cruelty. And when they had this, they, it says they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, removal, forgiveness, cleansing from sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto what generation? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day, how many people? There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers they were reproved of their sins and they repented and they came to the Lord look at chapter 3 Acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord look at verse 26 unto you first God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning every one of you away from there is iniquity chapter 26 of acts acts chapter 26 reading from verse 18 acts 26 verse 18 to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's what the Holy Ghost has come to do. He energizes the preachers so that the preachers will reprove the world of sin. Number two is to call us unto righteousness. We're coming to John chapter 6, chapter 16. John chapter 16, look at verse 8. And when he's come. He will reprove the world of sin. That's number one. And of righteousness. That's number two. Look at verse 10. Of righteousness. Because I go to my father. And you see me no more. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. Recall us to righteousness. That's what he comes to do. That's what the Holy Ghost does. Through the preacher. Calling people. Calling sinners. Calling everyone to righteousness in um, Acts chapter 24 Acts chapter 24 reading from verse 24 and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla which was a joyous he sent for Paul and heard him uh, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ remember what this uh, Felix wanted he wanted to hear about the faith in Christ. What did Paul the Apostle tell him? Just believe, believe without repentance. Just believe, believe without being reproved of sin. Just believe, believe without knowing that we must be righteous when we come to the Lord. Not at all. Look at verse 25. And as a reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's what the gospel is to reveal. That's what the preachers who are filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what you are to reveal. That's what you are to reveal. There's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption uh, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We're reading from Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I read from verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For they, the Israelites, they, the Jews, they, those who are trying to work out their own salvation without Christ, they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. How do we have the righteousness of God? Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth 
the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Look at this, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's how to have righteousness. You turn away from your sin. And you know you cannot reproduce or produce righteousness by yourself, but Christ. When you invite Christ in, when you give your life to Christ, and when you believe on the atonement that he made for you on the cross of Calvary, he will transfer his righteousness unto you. You will be righteous. Your sins will be taken away. The joy of salvation will come in your heart. Verse 10, of the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. One, he, can, he has come to report the world of sin. Two, he has come to recall us to righteousness. Number three, to remind us of judgment, of the judgment to come. We're looking at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Look at verse 8. And when he is come, number one, he will reprove the world of sin. Number two, and of righteousness. Number three, and of judgment. Now verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. There's judgment at the end of life. If somebody lives a life of sin, you enjoy sin, you embrace sin, you live in sin, you refuse to turn away from sin, and to turn to the Savior, and to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to change your life, to convert your soul, to cleanse your heart, and to make you live righteously if you reject salvation now. There's judgment at the end of the road of sinning. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, Yes, the same thing, judgment of God, it's coming, judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest another, which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after the hardness and the impenitent heart, you treasure up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's judgment. That's why if you have not repented, thank God tonight you repent. And then you give your life to Christ. And his righteousness will come in your heart, your life in Jesus' name. If you have repented already, you belong to the Lord. You make a covenant, consecration to the Lord. You will not turn away from the Lord. And you will escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done. Whether it be good or bad. God sees everything. God knows everything. God takes record of everything in our that you have done, that you are doing. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. He has assures us, as, and as it is appointed unto men, wants to die, but after this, the judgment. It's appointed unto men, wants to die, 
after this the judgment if somebody then after hearing the word of god goes back yeah, to his house and goes back to his community goes back to wherever he came from deliberately continues in sin what happens look at chapter 10 chapter 10 verse 26 chapter 10 verse 26 for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth when you come to the Bible study, it's revelation of the truth. It's the knowledge of the truth. And it is the proclamation of the truth about the Savior, about his sacrifice, and about Christ Jesus suffering for us and wanting to be the substitute, wanting to be the Savior, and wanting to be your Redeemer, to take your sins away. If after listening to all that, it says, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fair indignation, which shall devour the adversary. I pray that will not happen to you. Verse 38, 38, now the just shall live by faith you come to the lord you say lord i want to live i want to have eternal life i believe in you it says the judge shall live by faith but if any man draw back that's not me if any man draw back it will not be you you will not draw back if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. If you are not saved yet tonight, you are saved in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are saved, you will abide. Amen. You will continue. Amen. On that final day when judgment shall come upon the whole earth, the judgment will pass you by. Amen. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Here we're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, and I saw the dead, young and old, and I saw the dead, everyone, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Every bad thing that uh, you do is written in the book, that, your book of records. Every evil thing, terrible thing, sinful thing, licentious sin, devilish sin, disobedient sin that you do, enters into the book, the book of records. But the moment you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me, cleanse me, I take you to be my Savior. You died for me on the cross of Calvary. He will save you. He will forgive you. And all the sins in that book of record against your name, everyone will be blotted out nothing against you anymore and your name is taken out of the book of records and is put in another book in the book of life thank god my name is there i say thank god my name is there and there's no bad thing again because all those things are wiped away if it has not happened it will happen tonight the lord will cleanse you the lord will wash you and the lord will forgive you and the Lord will set you free. Look at verse, look at verse 13. And you see, give up the dead which were in each. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life tell me was cast into the lake of fire whosoever was not found reaching in that book of life 
he will be cast, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Before we pray, look at chapter 10 of Luke. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather, tell me, but rather, rejoice, but rather, if you want to rejoice, why don't you say it? But rather, rejoice because, because, because your names are written in heaven. God is going to write names in the book of life even tonight. And if your name is there, you renew your covenant to the Lord, your consecration to the Lord, nothing will take your name away from that book of life. And when the day of judgment will come, no judgment for you. No hell for you. No lake of fire for you. Heaven. 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 I am going there. there. What are you? Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. The Holy Spirit has come. He has come to report the world of sin. He has come to recall us unto righteousness. And he has come so that, so that, he remind us of the judgment to come. And the judgment can pass over you. Judgment can pass over you. If you will call upon the name of the Lord, and say, Lord, here am I. I turn away from my sin. I receive Jesus as my personal Savior. Your name will be in the book of life. Let it happen and let the Holy Ghost witness with your heart that it has happened before you go home today. He loves you. The mercy of God is available for you. Let him write your name in the book of life.